classical Greece, the birthplace of democracy, theater, and philosophy, lasted for less than two centuries, from 480 to 323 BC if you're keeping track at home. That's about 157 years. Compared to Pharaonic Egypt, the civilization known for its consistency and longevity, that's an incredibly short period of time. It's like if the United States was stopped existing as we know it around when Herbert Hoover was leaving office. So what's up with that? How did this short-lived phase of Greek history become one of the most influential periods in all of human history? The answer is twofold. The first is semantic. When archaeologists say classical Greece, they're referring to just one small part of ancient Greek history. And the contributions of Greece come from a long time frame that expend, extends both before and after the so-called classical period. The second reason is less factual and more debated. Most scholars would agree, however, that there were some developments within Greek politics, economics, and culture that led to the production of such unique lifeways and long-lasting achievements. Let's dive in, as Homer would put it, into the wine-dark sea and discover the history and legacy of ancient Greece. The rise of ancient Greece begins over 2,000 years before we get to the so-called Classical Period, right around 3000 BC. That, of course, is right around the same time that Upper and Lower Egypt united in the Nile River Valley, and around the same time that Sumerian culture in the city of Uruk spread throughout Mesopotamia. Clearly something was happening throughout the Mediterranean and the Near East about 5,000 years ago that was transforming societies in a way that was making them more complex and more hierarchical. In Egypt and the Near East, many scholars believe that it was large-scale irrigation projects that was leading the charge towards complexity. As populations grew and each person had a little less land to work, they needed to get more out of the land or develop previously unusable lands. The answer to this problem was large-scale irrigation. The flooding of the Nile, the Tigris, and the Euphrates gave the perfect opportunity for such a project, and these regions became vastly more productive right around this time. Now, irrigation is important for two reasons. First, you've got a lot more food, more grains and grapes and olives and, well, pizza. Well, no, they didn't actually have pizza. Tomatoes are a new world uh, food. That's not only delicious, but it means that you could save some extra food, a surplus, which allowed some people to be employed outside of food production. Now we've got artisans and architects and priests and people to do cool things like invent writing. And second, these huge irrigation plans now give you an excuse for hierarchical leadership. Someone needs to coordinate projects at that scale. And so you get political leaders, often the same people who are religious leaders, who aren't doing the manual labor, but rather organizing the large whole operation. Our very first split between management and labor. Karl Marx would be in the mood for a manifesto. Now in Egypt and Mesopotamia, these developments led to some monumental achievements fairly quickly. Sumerian Uruk had a population of approximately 50,000 people by around 2900 BC. And the Egyptian pyramids at Giza date to the mid-2500s BC. In comparison to these monumental developments, let's just say that the Greeks were taking their time. On the mainland, we do start to see some larger buildings, but nothing uh, that belongs in the same categories as pyramids or ziggurats. The House of the Tiles at the site of Lerna dates to around 2800 BC and stands out from regular houses due to its size, its second floor, its cache of administrative seals, and you guessed it, its roof tiles. Archaeologists aren't always the most creative. Out in the Cycladic Islands, the Cyclades are a wheel-shaped set of small islands centered around the holy island of Delos. People were starting to create anthropomorphic yet abstract statues, but still nothing on a particularly grand scale. That being said, the Cycladic figurines, as they're known, became incredibly popular as more abstract styles of art, like Picasso's Cubism, took off in the 20th century of the contemporary world. 
People still don't know exactly what these figurines were used for, but many have accentuated breasts and reproductive organs, suggesting some association with fertility. Monumental architecture on a truly grand scale in Greece doesn't start until the second millennium BC, almost a thousand years after the pyramids of Giza. To see its earliest origins, we stay in the islands but head to Crete, the largest of the Greek islands. Crete was home to what we now refer to as the Minoan culture. And if you're thinking, what's up with this Minoan culture? Why don't they just call it the Cretan culture? You know, named after the island of Crete. Well, 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 my good friend, I'm glad you asked. It all goes back to the 19th century, when the archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans started excavating the site of Knossos in Crete. The massive building at Knossos was so convoluted and complex that Evans thought it resembled a labyrinth, like the one that held the monstrous minotaur, half man, half bull. Now we're getting a little off track here, talking about island etymologies in Greek mythology, but it's an awesome story, and Greek mythology has some crazy ass shit, so we should go for it. It all begins, like most stories, with Zeus turning himself into a bull so that he can steal a Phoenician princess named Europa and fly her off to the island of Crete. If you ever take my mythology class, you'll realize about 90% of Greek mythology is Zeus turning himself into animals so he can get busy with various mortal women. Not really that cool, Zeus. Not cool at all. Anyway, nine months later, Baby Minos is born in, on Crete and eventually becomes its first king. Now, as an island, Crete was always important to Poseidon, god of the sea. And as a result, King Minos had to sacrifice his best bull to Poseidon each and every year. One year, however, Minos had a bull that was just too beautiful to give away. Don't ask me what that means. I have no idea. Anyway, he sacrificed his second best bull to Poseidon. And I mean, like, I'm reading this and I'm kind of like, come on, like Poseidon's not going to figure that out. Like it's your second best one and you're hiding the really, really good one. But anyway, when, a, when Poseidon does figure it out, he comes up with some really messed up poetic justice. Poseidon makes the wife of Minos, a woman named Pasiphae, fall in love with this beautiful bull. In fact, she's so in love with the bull that she has her palace architect, apparently she has a palace architect, a man named Daedalus build her a cow costume so that she can get inside and have relations of the most intimate nature with this beautiful bull. I told you guys, Greek mythology has some crazy stuff here. Now we're not going to dwell on Minos and Pasiphae's love life after this. I mean, imagine your girlfriend cheating on you with an actual bull. But let's just say that nine months later, the Minotaur, half man, half bull, was born. Naturally, he was hideous. So disgusting, in fact, that Minos locked him up in the labyrinth beneath the palace, a labyrinth built by his architect Daedalus. And if you're wondering how Daedalus stayed employed after building the cow costume for Pasiphae, I'm wondering that as well. I probably would have fired him myself, but I guess she kind of wore the pants in that relationship. I don't know. I don't get it. Anyway, anyway, Athens at this time was in debt to Minos, and they had to send seven young boys and girls to Crete each year. Minos would then send them into the labyrinth as fresh food for the hideous Minotaur. That all changed when the hero Theseus volunteered to go and made his way to the island of Crete. There he seduced Ariadne, daughter of the king, and got her to help him. She gave him a ball of thread which Theseus then left behind as he searched the labyrinth a perfect strategy so that he could find his way out afterwards. After finding the Minotaur, an epic battle ensued, and eventually Theseus slew the Minotaur, then used the thread to find his way out of the labyrinth. Meanwhile, as a side note to this very long story, the architect Daedalus was also imprisoned in the labyrinth itself, and he was put there so that he couldn't give away the secret of the labyrinth to anyone else. Now he was there with his son Icarus, and being the innovator that he was, he built a pair of wings for himself and his son out of wax. Finding the right moment, they flew out of the labyrinth to freedom, except for one small problem. Kid Icarus got a little cocky and flew a little too close to the sun. The sun melted the wax wings and he plunged to his demise deep within the Mediterranean Sea. 
So Theseus killed the horrible Minotaur and saved the day. End of story, right? Wrong! You forgot the really weird epilogue. Theseus and Ariadne run away together. She knows her dad would be pissed because she helped Theseus, and they sail to the beautiful island of Naxos to live, ha live happily ever after. Except for the fact that once on Naxos, Theseus totally abandons Ariadne, not cool bro, and just leaves her there. It doesn't have a good ending for him though. As he sets sail back for Athens, he forgets to change his sails from black to white, which would have indicated that he survived and was successful in his quest. His dad, King Aegeus, gets so upset that he throws himself off of a cliff. His own demise in the Aegean Sea. Bad move, Theseus. And the story does have a happy ending for Ariadne. The god Dionysus eventually finds her, marries her, and she spends the rest of her days in an eternal party with the god of wine. Not a bad way to end up. Now where the crap were we? Oh yeah, all right. The Minoans! Minoans, yes! So, long story short, the Minoans are named after King Minos and his bull-loving ways. And that bull-loving seems particularly appropriate for Minoan culture, which is littered with references to bulls. We have bull frescoes depicting young men leaping over the backs of bulls. We have bull horns set up to receive sacrifices or as architectural decoration. And we have bull pottery so that you can literally drink from the bull's mouth. The Minoans are famous for being weirdly peaceful in a generally militaristic Bronze Age ecology. Their material culture is all floral and faunal, lotus plants and dolphins and octopuses and other nice friendly creatures. Like blue monkeys. Weirdly enough, none of their major palaces, even the monumental Gnosis that Sir Arthur Effens excavated, had defensive walls. And for 500 years that served the palaces just fine right until around 1400 BC, when the Mycenaeans from mainland Greece decided these peaceful hippies would be ripe for the plundering. The Mycenaean culture is essentially the mainland equivalent of Minoan culture, flourishing in the second millennium or 1000s BC. Instead of being peaceful bull leapers, however, the Mycenaeans were renowned for their warlike culture. Their defensive walls are now called Cyclopean, meaning only the gigantic cyclops could have lifted such large rocks. In addition, they had boar's tusk helmets and inlaid swords, all suggesting a warlike culture. The Mycenaeans, in fact, are one of the main city-states that led the Greeks into battle against the Trojans in Homer's Iliad. Even though Homer was writing 400 years later, the military might of Mycenae must have been legendary. One of the most famous artifacts, a golden burial mask found deep within a shaft grave, was deemed the Ask of Agamemnon, leader of the Greeks in the Trojan War. And although it almost certainly didn't belong to Agamemnon, even if it was, even if he was a real dude, the mask does signal the impressive wealth of the leaders of Mycenaean Greece. So the Aegean and the Bronze Age was a mixture of similar yet distinct cultures. Both the Mycenaeans and Minoans had strong centralized governments that revolved around major palaces. For the Minoans, these are at places like Knossos and Phaistos and Zacros, while for the Mycenaeans, they are at Mycenae and Tiryns and Pylos. Within these palaces, ceramic tablets have been discovered with a mysterious script known as Linear B, which was finally translated in the 1950s. It was revealed to be an early form of the Greek language, and it recorded the economic transactions between the people in their palaces and between different city-states. This makes us think that Bronze Age Greece was highly redistributive. People sent their goods to the palace, then the palace redistributed these goods back to the people. This makes sense if people specialized in terms of what they grew, because now they could get all the different types of goods they needed just by submitting their one specialized type to the palace. So both civilizations had monumental political architecture, and both civilizations were city-states, where different cities share culture and language and religion, but have different political leaders. Yet the distinction between the peaceful Minoans, with their dolphin frescoes and lack of walls, compared to the warlike Mycenaeans, with their cyclopean walls and inlaid daggers, highlights a key difference between the civilizations. Chinua Achebe once said that things fall apart, and that is certainly true for state-level societies at the end of the Bronze Age. 
All over the Near East and Mediterranean, many of the once thriving civilizations, the Mycenaeans and Minoans and Hittites and Egyptians, were all severely damaged between 1200 and 1100 BC, what we call the collapse of the Bronze Age. The crazy thing isn't that one of these fell, but rather that all areas were so heavily impacted within such a short time frame. The traditional explanation for this collapse comes from an Egyptian inscription which blames the Sea Peoples, a diverse group of seafarers from all over the Mediterranean. But this doesn't explain why they never settled down after taking over any of the sites. And it also doesn't explain why they had an impact at so many inland sites. Today, scholars tend to think that it was more of a combination of causes rather than just a singular explanation. Environmental catastrophe and internal revolt and external invasion all pl probably played some role. With the collapse of the Bronze Age, we're ushered into what are known as the Greek Dark Ages, which lasted from around 1150 to 750 BC. We call them the Dark Ages because everything got crappier. No longer is there the large centralized governments of the Mycenaeans and Minoans. Along with them, the massive palace complexes disappear. The settlements where normal people live become much smaller, and the grave goods put into burials become much poorer. Art goes from leaping dolphins to, and octopuses to a series of concentric circles, and long-distance trade greatly diminishes as well. Perhaps biggest of all, writing actually disappears for about 400 years. They forgot how to freaking write. Those must have been dark days indeed. That all began to change in the 8th century or the 700s BC, when, like a phoenix from the ashes, the city-states of Greece began to grow and prosper once again. Evidence from the polar ice cores suggests that the temperatures cooled a few degree, degrees and rains increased, likely leading to better crop yields and an increase in population. That population growth spurred one of the pivotal events in Greek history, the colonization of the Mediterranean. Greeks sailed from their home city-states across the sea, founding colonies on the east coast of the Black Sea all the way west to Spain and the Iberian Peninsula. Sicily and southern Italy became so littered with Greek colonies that it actually became known as Magna Graecia, or Greater Greece. In many of Italy's most famous towns, places like Naples and Syracuse, had their origins as Greek colonies. Founded on the island of Ith Ischia, Pithecusae, very literally Monkey Island, was the very first Greek colony, and it was founded in 775 BC. Taking a look at the island today, it's easy to see why they chose the spot. Colonization wasn't the only development of the 8th century. Right around the same time uh, Pithecusae was founded, we get the very first Olympic Games, 776 BC. We also get some of the earliest Greek temples. They weren't quite the monumental marble monstrosities that we see today, but they are recognizable as religious uh, structures archaeologically. Iconographic pottery finally makes a comeback as well. If you remember back to the Bronze Age, pottery was painted with cool floral and faunal designs, octopuses and dolphins and all that awesome stuff. Then during the Dark Ages, all that disappears. A few geometric designs are all that exist. Finally, during the 8th century BC, we get a mix of the two things. Vases are still fairly geometric, but people and animals have started to become reintegrated into the decoration, even if they're still in primarily geometric form. Perhaps most importantly, we get the return of writing! Finally, after 400 years, it's back. This time it's not in syllabic script like Linear B, but rather a true alphabet that includes both consonants and vowels. And because of this, it can be used to transcribe all the sounds of the spoken language. And amazingly, that's what it's used for. Remember when we saw the earlier writing of the Bronze Age, it was mainly used for record keeping, a language of accounting. But now, it's used to describe the epic tales of myth and history and legend. The origin of the Olympian gods in the works of Hesiod, the epic battle of the Greeks and Trojans in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Writing is back and it's better than ever, and it's in large part because of their writings that the ancient Greeks were so influential for so long. Socially and politically, Greece was also in the midst of change. Whereas the Bronze Age had powerful kings inside enormous palaces, the political leaders of 8th century held far less power. 
In fact, this trend of moving from strong centralized power towards more dispersed power amongst a larger group of people eventually leads to what is perhaps Greece's contribution, most important contribution to the modern world. Democracy. Now let's take a second and think about how weird this is. Most people and cultures aren't in the business of evenly distributing power amongst a huge group of people. In the Near East during this time, for example, monarchies had become more powerful than ever before. And they were followed by the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians and a bunch of other civilizations that all centered along their political strength in the hands of a single, enormously powerful king. So it's really worthwhile to think about what made Greece so unique in this respect. Scholars have suggested three main factors that led Greece towards political and social equality. And the first is money. The distribution of wealth was far more equal in Greece than it was in the Near Eastern empires. Herodotus, for example, marvels at the fact that one Greek guy was able to supply sil enough silver to build, equip, and sail a trireme, a Greek version of warship. However, at the exact same time in Persia, one aristocrat, not even the king himself, had enough silver to build, equip, and sail over 2,000 similar ships. And that's just one of many aristocrats. So people generally had more, kind of more equal amounts of money in Greece, and that's one of the big differences between Greece and the Near East, and one that set them on the path towards social and political equality. Next up, we have warfare. It might seem kind of surprising to suggest military tactics are one of the main drivers of equality, but hear me out on this one. We often suggest that the Bronze Age and Dark Ages were the time of heroes, where people like Achilles and Hector could go out and do one-on-one -on -one battle against each other, winning fame for generations to come. That heroic individual style of warfare changed sometime around the 8th century BC, however, and was replaced by something that's known as phalanx warfare. The phalanx was the Greek military formation where heavily armored soldiers stood closely packed next to one another. So the shield of one soldier covered half of the soldier next to him. Then they marched slowly forward with long spears out in front, trying to break the enemy line. In this type of formation, there was no room for individualism or heroism. Breaking form from the phalanx would undoubtedly result in a quick death. So this reliance on the group and the relative equality within the group of men likely helped facilitate social and political equality as well. And finally, we have religious ideology. In most cultures leading up to this time, religion had been the domain of priests. In order to connect with the gods, one had to go through an intermediary, like a priest or temple or something of that nature. In Greece, however, any citizen was able to worship the gods whenever they wanted. No single person, like a king for example, could claim to hold a special relationship with the gods, and that was special uh, that was special or distinct from anyone else. And so equality within the economy and military and religion eventually led to equality within the political realm as well. But this didn't happen all at once. During the Archaic period in Greece, which lasted from around 750 BC to around 480 BC, government styles changed frequently, and city-states had very different types of government. Many were ruled by oligarchies, which literally means the rule of the few, and consisted of a small group of aristocratic male leaders. Sometimes one guy would try to take over sole power. These individuals were known as tyrants, and they often achieved their position in devious ways. In Sicily, for example, there was, one commission, there was once a commission to build a temple. Basically, different people could submit bids for how much it would cost them to build the temple. Lowest bid would win, they'd get the money and get to build it. And upon winning the bid, this one guy took the money from the town, bought a bunch of mercenaries, took over the town, and installed himself as tyrant. Sneaky move, dude. Greek innovations during the Archaic period didn't end there, though. We also get the first monumental stone temples. So when you go to Greece today and see the massive temples like the Parthenon, Know that the earliest of those were built not in classical Greece, but in archaic Greece, starting in the 7th century or 600s BC. Same thing for the awesome Greek pottery. Black figure pottery, where the background is reddish or orange and the people are left in black silhouette, was invented during the 6th century or 500s BC. 
We also get early natural philosophers who were asking questions about the nature of the world and the earliest historians like Herodotus who sought to explain how human cultures got to be the way they were. Finally, at the end of the Archaic period, we get the development of democracy between 510 and 508. Rather than being a long, thought-out process, the whole thing actually happened very quickly. Athens was in the middle of a quarrel with Sparta when the Athenian tyrant was deposed. Knowing they better get their act together quickly before Sparta came marching back to attack, they commissioned the Athenian city and citizen Cleisthenes to design a new system. And in his system, known as Democratia, or power of the people, each male citizen had the chance to vote on the affairs of the state. It was a direct democracy, so people didn't vote on representatives, but rather on each issue themselves. Should we go to war? Vote by the people. Should we raise taxes? Vote by the people. Should we build a new temple? Vote by the people. You get the point. Pretty cool way of doing things when you consider how little it can feel like our vote matters in the current political system today. Right around this time, when Athens and Sparta were squabbling and democracy had been was being invented, Athens also got themselves into trouble with the Persian Empire. And after some Greek city-states on the west coast of Turkey revolted against Persian rule in the 490s, the Persian Empire struck back, burning those cities and eventually making their way to mainland Greece. Surprisingly, however, the Athenians were able to fend off the Persians at the Battle of Marathon in 490 after which Pheidippides ran his famous 26.2 miles back from the battle site to the city of Athens to announce the victory. That wasn't the end of it, though. Ten years later, the Persians came back for revenge. This time, instead of a small group of about 30,000 soldiers, they brought an enormous force. Herodotus suggests millions, but scholars think it was probably around 500,000 people. An incredible number considering most city-states only had a few tens of thousands of people. The Greeks, led by the Spartans, tried to make their stand at Thermopylae, but eventually were overwhelmed. Days later, the Athenian Acropolis was burned by the Persians. With the victory seemingly in their hands, the Persians made a terrible blunder, though. They were coaxed into naval battle near the Straits of Artemisian, and here, on sea, the Greeks were superior, since all over Greece, the entire place is basically a series of coastlines and islands, and seafaring had been huge for centuries. The Persians, on the other hand, had a primarily land-based empire, and much of their navy didn't even know how to swim. Thousands drowned as the small Greek city-states vanquished huge, the huge Persian imperial fleet. This Greek victory, followed by a couple more the following year, put an end to the Persian invasions of Greece and ushered in the classical period of Greece, dating from around 480 to 323 BC. It was during this time that the Greeks perfected so many of the things that we remember them for. The Athenians rebuilt the Acropolis with the famous Parthenon, the pinnacle of Doric temple architecture. Black figure vase painting evolved into red figure vase painting, where the human form was now depicted in reddish orange while the background remained black. Philosophy hit its peak with thinkers like Socrates and Plato and a century, century later, Aristotle. Drama and theater became huge with tragedies that taught lessons through the stories of the gods and comedy that used humor to comment on current political situations. And while the Persians had been driven back, there was no shortage of, shortage of contentious political situ situations to satirize. The biggest of these was the Peloponnesian War a conflict between Athens and Sparta that lasted all the way from 431 to 404 BC. Barely 50 years after defeating the Persians, Athens had grown in wealth and power and influence to an unprecedented degree. Sparta tried to check Athens, and soon this erupted into full-fledged full war. After numerous bumbling mistakes, Athens eventually succumbed to the Spartans at the site of Igospotomy in 404, and was removed from the peak atop the pyramid of Greek city-states. While classical Greece continued for another 80 years, the Golden Age in Athens had come to its close. Over the course of the 4th century BC, Athens and Sparta and Thebes all vied for power. But at the same time, small distant regions that were once backwaters started to become more formidable as well. Foremost among these was Macedonia, a region of northwestern Greece, 
By the mid-300s, the Macedonian ruler Philip II was able to unite much of Greece under a single political power, almost sort of like a kind of Near Eastern Empire. And remember that this is unique since it had always been a series of independently run city-states, each with their own government. Philip was eventually assassinated at his own wedding, and power was left to his untested young son, Alexander III, later to become Alexander the Great. Alexander quickly asserted his authority, re-establishing his rule over a united Greece, and then set off to uh, avenge the Persian attacks 150 years before. Winning battle after battle, Alexander was able to bring the mighty Persian Empire and its king, Darius III, to its knees. But that wasn't enough. Alexander continued east all the way until he reached India. And we can still see his influence out there in Gandharan art, a cool style of iconography that displays Hindu stories, but in the style of classical Greek sculpture. Alexander the Great drank himself to death on his way back from India, and his empire, the greatest the world had ever known, was split up amongst his generals. It's almost like Westeros in Game of Thrones, where the power vacuum led to a conflict of a bunch of successors fighting for the Iron Throne. These conflicts in large part stalemated, however, and it wasn't until the Romans expanded outside of Italy that someone could reunite the fractured lands. During the second century BC, much of Greece came under Roman rule. Rome had a very interesting relationship with ancient Greece. It was always militarily superior, but it always felt culturally inferior. It respected Greek art and drama and philosophy to such an extent that much of what Rome produced was modeled on its predecessor. And that actually leaves us at a good concluding point for this overview of Greece. Today, we, just like the Romans, have a profound respect for the developments of this unique society. The influence of its philosophy and architectural styles and democracy can all still be seen with us today. And so while classical Greece may have lasted less than two centuries, its impact stretches far beyond its shores and thousands of years beyond its time, solidifying itself as one of the pillars of Western culture and civilization.